Okay, and uh, my name is Krista Cham Sai Tong. I'm from the English department. And um, today I'll be doing the analytical writing and also the reading comprehension section. Okay, so um, let me um, turn on the slides here. Okay, so we'll begin with the analytical writing section first. Okay, so. Um, for the analytical writing section, um, generally you will have two parts okay, in this uh, writing section. And uh, the two part consists of the issue essay, and you'll have about 30 minutes or so for that part. Okay? And the next part is the argument essay, right? And then you'll have the third 30 minutes again. Okay? And you'll have one minute break in between. Okay? All this is done on a computer as well. Okay? And um, for this part, um, the GRE will give you just one holistic score for both parts. Okay, um, the issue essay and the argument essay they will be on average. Okay, and you'll get only one score, ranging from one to six. Okay, and two people will score your essay. Okay, and if they differ by one score, the third person will be assigned to score your essay. Okay, so that's good. And um, the holistic uh, scores will range from a zero to six, okay? And uh, nobody will get a zero if, if you write something, of course, right? And um, write something on the topic, of course. But uh, you should aim for three to six, okay? Anything below, um, actually four to six. Anything below four will kind of uh, give a bad impression on your application. So um, at least you should get a four. Okay, and at best you should get a six. Okay, and then today I will give you some strategies to get five or six. Okay, and um, you can see the rubric um, in the Kaplan book on page uh, 322 to 323. Okay, but uh, I reproduced that here for your convenience. Okay, and um, you can see that uh, from six to four here. Okay. Um, the differences lie in the quality of the argument. Okay? For a score of six, you need to give uh, a, an insightfully presentation and convincingly support for the argument. Okay? And for five, you have to present a well-chosen example and strong support uh, of your opinion. Okay? But for four, it adequately presents and supports an opinion. Okay, so you can see that the differences lie in the quality, okay, and also the quantity of the errors you make as well, okay. And the errors you make could be the spelling errors or could be grammatical errors, okay. And uh, Kaplan book, the Kaplan book has um, a review on grammar and mechanics, and that's going to be on page um, 238 to page 266, okay. But we won't go over that today, okay. But uh, I'll pay attention to um, how you can structure your argument and how you can detect the logical flaws. Okay, so, so um, let's talk about the issue essay first. Okay, and then we'll move on to the argument essay later on. Okay, for the um, for the issue essay. Okay. You are given a brief quotation of an in issue of general interest, okay? And you have to discuss it, making use of your own educational and personal background, okay? And you will have to give supporting evidence in forms of examples, okay? Uh, maybe it could be current or historical events. Maybe it could be things that you have read before or um, any hypothetical situations, okay? But you need examples that serve as the evidence for your argument, okay? And this part requires you to construct your own argument through a thesis, or I would call it a claim, and evidence, okay, in, your, in support of your position on a given issue, okay? So you need to have an explicit thesis statement, okay, and evidence that supports the thesis, okay? And you can find um, 
topic pools on the GRE website, uh, gre.org. Okay, they will give you about 200 topics or so uh, for you to practice. Okay, so um, the tips that I can give you for this uh, particular section is that first you must take a position. Okay, in an issue essay, you must take a position. Okay, and three positions are available for you to take. The first one is you agree totally with the view presented. Okay, the second one is you disagree totally with the view presented to you. And the third one, you can qualify the issue, okay? And I call it the partial agreement or disagreement, okay? And um, it depends. I would call that it depends um, um, stance, okay? And which position you choose depends on your preference, okay? And your ability to persuade the readers, okay? If you think that you can write more on, um, let's say, that you agree totally with the, the issue, then you should go for that position, okay? If you don't think that uh, you can agree with the issue totally, you must select the, to qualify the issue, okay? And there is no right or wrong answer for this particular section, okay? But um, what matters is an explicit statement of thesis, okay? And um, your evidence to support the thesis, okay? And your score depends on how well you support your position, okay? So uh, let me give you an example, okay? So let's say that this is the topic for this section, okay? Which you can see on the slide here, okay? Plagiarism is a big problem in the world of academic and usually technology is responsible for it. So students should not be allowed to use technology at all, okay? So when you, give, when you are given this issue, okay? Uh, the key word here is at all. Right? And the proposal is students should not be allowed to use technology. Okay? So depending on your preference, you can agree totally with that conclusion or that proposal, or you can disagree with it, or you can qualify it. Okay? And um, uh, just personally, okay, I would qualify the issue. I could say that um, in a lot of cases, technology is very useful in classrooms, okay? And in a few cases, okay, uh, technology should be banned because um, it could lead to plagiarism, for example, during the exam, okay? So I could do that, right? So um, that's one example. For those of you who want to agree totally with the issue, okay, what you need to do is that you need to show that uh, technology is harmful and technology will lead to plagiarism, okay? And the disadvantages of using technology would be um, kind of uh, too much to bear, okay? And um, I'm not sure that I could support that position because uh, I could always find exceptions. That's why I would rather go with the um, qualifying the issue uh, position, okay? So, but there's no right or wrong. It depends on how you support your uh, point of view, okay? So uh, for the steps to take in this section, okay, I have about five steps for you to take, okay, and I have also the time limits here as well, okay. So within 30 minutes, you could do a lot, okay. The first step that I would like you to do is when you're given a topic, you should try to understand the topic, okay. What is it that that topic is proposing to you, okay. So you should spend about one to two minutes there. Okay, um, then you should select a position, choose a position, right? And remember, three positions are available, agree, disagree, or case by case, right? Or you can qualify the issue. So for, against, or in between. So two minutes there for you to make the decision. And then just gather the points by means of a mind map. I'll show you how to do a mind map in a minute here. And, uh, or you can use the outline to help you to organize your ideas. And then add details and examples to the mind map as you type, okay? And you should spend probably about 17 minutes there. And then finally, reread what you type, and then revise and edit the essay. You should spend about five minutes there. So totally, it would be 30 minutes, okay? So you should have ample time to finish this, sufficient time to finish this, okay? So let's see how I implement these steps when I'm given a topic to write about, okay? 
So let's suppose that we get this topic, okay? And uh, the topic is public service activities should be required of all college students if we hope them to receive a balanced education, okay? So this is the issue, okay? And the proposal is that all college students should be required to do public service activities because that's good for the education that they get, right? So you understand the topic now, right? So you will have next step is for you to take a position, whether you want to agree totally, disagree totally, or um, qualify the issue, right? Uh, personally, I like to qualify the issue because it allows me to, to show that I think, to show that I think about the issue kind of in a more rounded manner, okay? To think about the issue more comprehensively, so I will qualify this issue, okay? So I will say that while um, public activities are useful for students, okay, in some cases it might not be a good idea to require that for all students, okay? So I will take that position, okay? So the next position is I could gather points by a mind map or an outline, okay? So let me show you how to do a mind map here, okay? So uh, basically you use kind of a diagram Okay, so I will first start with the summary of the issue. Okay, so the summary of the issue is public service activities for all students. Okay, so let's start with that, right? And then I have already taken a position, right? So I said that I will qualify the issue. I will partially agree with it and I will partially disagree with it. Okay, so uh, some reasons as to why I don't think that that's a good idea include, um, for example, too many activities can lead to unbalance education, right? Because the purpose of this is for students to have a balanced education, right? But too many activities required of them might lead to the negative side of that, right? So that's one point, okay? The second point is it could be too much for students who already have work to do, okay? Who already work or who have other responsibilities, okay? Some of the students are already social workers, okay? So they already do public service activities, right? So for these students, it might be too much for them, okay? And they might have families to take care of and so on. So it could be in this category as well, okay? Um, third one, you could, you could say that public service activities should be a choice rather than a requirement, right? Because altruism, um, doing good things for the public, should not be forced, okay? Shouldn't be forced on people, right? So these are three reasons why I don't agree completely with the issue, okay? However, I could say that public activities are still useful, right, for some students. So I would have a kind of what I call the counter-argument uh, position there. And I would say that for students who are willing to do this, you could give that as an extra credit activity, okay? Or you, they could choose to substitute other class requirements, okay, uh, with the public service activities, okay? So for other students who are not, uh, occupied um, in other ways, they could choose to do that. As extra credit, okay? So this is my mind map, okay? And then you do this on scratch paper, okay? And then you can start typing, okay? And fill in the details, okay? Or you can use an outline like this, OK? 
okay? You have that on your handout as well, okay? So this outline will begin with the introduction uh, and three paragraphs and then the conclusion, okay? At least you should have five paragraphs, okay, for your issue essay, okay? And this is similar to your mind map, okay, that we just drew here, okay? So each of the ideas here represents one paragraph, okay? And the qualifying section here will represent another paragraph, okay? So it's the same thing. Um, just up to you which uh, way you want to do it, okay? And then you start typing and start adding details to the paragraph, okay? And the last step is to reread, re revise, and edit, okay? So be careful about grammar, punctuation, spelling, and non-academic voice. Okay? A lot of people like to use informal or spoken language when they write, and that's going to uh, bring the score down. Okay? For example, things that you should avoid, you should avoid are things like uh, well, okay? the, the filler well, or you know, something like that. That are characteristics of spoken language. Uh, judgmental terms like so stupid, right? or hedges like I think, okay? Um, um, that would kind of um, weaken your position a bit, okay? And um, addressing the reader with you, like you should know and so on, okay? So you should make it formal. Question? Um, for terminology that may be not universally known, like things like think outside the box or can we use those? Um, you can, but uh, if you're not sure that that's universally known, as you said, you might want to define your terms in the essay. Okay? You can say, by thinking outside the box, I mean, or something like that. Okay? So the more clarified it is, the better for you. Okay? So good question. Okay? So let me show you the finished essay for that last topic that we just uh, looked at. Okay, uh, you have this on your handout. Okay. Okay. So, um, to use the same example. Okay. This is the first paragraph. Okay. And in the first paragraph, what you do is you start. Okay. You start with the restatement of the topic. Okay. So here. I start with, some colleges are implementing a new requirement demanding students to engage in public service activities, hoping that with that experience, the students would receive a balanced, well-rounded education. Okay? This is a separate handout okay, that you should have. So um, here you start with a restatement of the topic to show that you understand what's going on okay, in, the, in the issue. So you start off with that, okay? And then the next thing that you will have is your claim. So this is the restatement. So I'll put it here, restatement of the issue, okay? You start off with that, so you kind of reword the question, okay? To show your understanding of the issue, to show your analytical and critical uh, eye. And then what comes next is your explicit thesis. Okay? It has to be explicit, okay? and it will come second to that restatement. So you will say, in this case, I'm not against such a goodwill, but I will point out that without some conditions, this new requirement may prove detrimental rather than beneficial. Okay? So that's my qualifying statement. Okay? So it has to be explicit. Okay? So you are done with that first paragraph, which is the intro paragraph. Then you move on to the first reason, right? Um, this is the reason that you have on the mind map or the outline already. Okay. So the first, the first sentence or so, the first sentence or the first two sentences would be the issue that you have um, against that uh, position, right? So this is reason one. Okay. Reason one is because some students are already working as full-time employees, okay, either on and off campus, that would be requiring uh, public activities would be too burdensome for them. Okay, so that's your first reason, right? So you will have that 
as the first statement, okay, your reason, okay? And then what follows is going to be your evidence, okay? So this would be your evidence and examples. Okay? You can use your personal experience. You can use something that you have already read. You can use uh, something that you uh, imagine. Okay? But make sure that it's relevant to what you are doing here, what you are uh, discussing here. Okay? So it should be like that. Now, that's the second paragraph, right? Uh, the third paragraph, let's see. The third paragraph will be the same thing, okay? Will be the second reason, okay? So this is the second reason. And you follow that up with more examples and evidence in relation to the second reason, okay? Notice that you want to make everything connected, every paragraph connected, so you want to transition words like in addition here, okay, to show that this paragraph is connected to the previous paragraph, okay? So you do that with the third one. Now you come to the fourth paragraph, right? And this is where you will indicate the qualifying issue, right? So you start with the transition word, however, do you see that? Uh, to indicate that it's contrastive. Okay, it's, it's a contrastive idea, okay? And again, you will have the third, uh, the third point here, the third reason or the third point. And uh, what follows is going to be evidence again in the form of examples, personal examples, or something that you have already read, okay? And finally, you come to the last paragraph, okay? And in this last paragraph, you will summarize all the reasons that you have talked about so far. Okay, so this is the summary. Okay? And perhaps you should give some solution to the issue, okay? which is a way to end the essay on a strong note, okay? In this case, the way that I end it with a strong note is to say that instead, the issue should be who would be required to engage in public activities rather than required of all students, okay? And if a choice should be given to those students who are not willing to perform the service, okay? so. This is just another way to look at the issue. Okay, so give some kind of solution to the to the um, to the issue, and also to summarize all the points that you have made. Okay, so this is easy, as you can see. So what? Um, let's see. Let me close the ink here. So from here, in the whole um, from the whole essay here, okay. What you can see is that first you'll start with the intro paragraph in which you restate the issue and then follow it up with the thesis statement, right? And then three paragraphs stating different reasons, okay, for or against the issue, right? And then with a concluding paragraph, okay? So that form, okay, could be used for all the issue essays that you will see on the GRE test, okay? So any questions? And um, here, um, I give you a useful template for you to use, okay? And you can construct this template at home, okay, before you go into the test room, okay, and practice using the template, okay? And you have this on your handout as well. Okay, so in paragraph one, paraphrase the issue, restate the issue, and then if you want to qualify, okay, the issue, um, have that word, okay, use that word, however, okay, 
and then with your claim. Followed it up with your claim. And then three or four paragraphs stating your different reasons. Okay, sorry for that. Stating your reasons uh, using your personal experience, news, historical events, or a statistic, or whatever you want to use. Okay, and uh, they should be similar. Okay, as supporting paragraphs. And then you can come to the conclusion, restate your position, and the reason why you want to reposition the issue. Okay, so that should be the template that you use. Okay, it's like the backbone of your paper. Okay, no matter which topic you are given, you can use this template. Okay, so it's a useful template to have. Okay, so what's going to be different? is the examples that you use and uh, the reason that you use, right? But the template is going to be the same, OK? So uh, to summarize, uh, things to remember for you, your essay must have five paragraphs at least, or six, OK, if you have more than three reasons. Um, intro, the body, at least three paragraphs of supporting ideas, and if applicable, a qualifying section, OK, and a conclusion. Okay. And in the introduction, there must be an explicit thesis that states your position. Okay. And your body paragraph must su provide supporting ideas for your position okay, in the thesis. Okay. Don't just assert that something is the case. Rather, justify your position okay. using examples, using statistics, whatever you know. Okay. And the issue is going to be an issue of general interest. So it shouldn't require you to use your biology knowledge or anything like that. Okay? So everyone should have um, a lot to say on a particular issue based on your experience. Okay? So if we have time, we'll uh, come back and practice that. Okay? So let's move on to um, the next section on the analytical writing section, which is the argument essay. Okay? And for this section, you'll be given 30 minutes, okay? just as you are given 30 minutes for the issue essay. Okay? For this section, okay, this section aims to test your critical and analytical skills. Okay? It asks you to write a critique of an argument presented as a so short passage. Okay? And you have to consider the logical soundness of that argument. Okay? In other words, the author has already drawn a conclusion, okay, and you need to determine whether that conclusion is logical or not. Okay? Is there any problem, logical problem, with that conclusion? Okay? And then after that, you should propose some ways to improve that conclusion. Okay? And let me tell you this, that all the statements that you are given will be logically flawed in some way. Okay? They won't give you a statement that's perfect okay? because they want to test your ability to find faults with the statement. So every statement that you see on the GRE exam will be logically flawed in some way. Okay? And this is a place for you to identify, present, and discuss logical flaws. Okay? It's not a place to show your agreement or disagreement with the issue, unlike the issue essay. Right? So here you're not constructing your argument or your position as to how we should um, support the government or anything like that. But you will have to find faults okay, with the author's position. Okay? So this is a different task. Okay? And to tackle this part, you have to understand three things, and I will talk you through. I will walk you through these three things. Okay, the first thing is the argument structure. The second thing is what we call unstated assumptions, and the third one is common logical fallacies. And when you understand these three things, you can do this part. Okay, so let's start with the argument structure. Okay, um, keep in mind that every argument in this world, okay, every argument has three parts. Okay, you will have the first part is the thesis or the conclusion. That's the same thing. Okay, the thesis or the conclusion are the same thing, and um, that's the claim or the thesis. And you can test whether something, whether a statement is a thesis or a conclusion, by putting the word "so" in front of it. Okay, if it fits there, then it's the thesis. 
okay? Or therefore, okay? And the second part of it, the argument is the reason, okay? The reason is what the author uses to support the thesis, okay? You will be given these two things on your exam, okay? The thesis and the reason, okay? But the third thing, which is the unstated assumption, okay? You will have to figure that out, okay? And um, what you have to write on the paper, okay, or on the screen, is that, okay, just the unstated assumption. The unstated assumption, what it does is it bridge, bridges the conclusion and the reason together, okay, and without this unstated assumption, you cannot get the thesis, okay? So this is a kind of a diagram showing how these three parts work together, okay? The reason supports the thesis or the conclusion, and the assumption kind of bridges these two parts together, okay? So let me show you some real examples, okay? So suppose you are given this statement, okay, that because the copy machine has broken down and because our employees need to make copies, okay, our company has to buy a new copy machine. Okay? Remember on the GRE test, you are given the thesis and also the reason, right? You are given two things. You have to find the unstated assumptions. Okay? So to test which statement is the conclusion, you can supply the word so in front of it, right? So you can supply the word so here. So our company has to buy a new copy machine, right? And it works. So that's the thesis. Okay, that's the proposal. And the reason is going to be other part, the other part. Because the copy machine has broken down and because our employee needs to make copies, that's the reason. The conclusion or the thesis is our company has to buy a new copy machine. Okay? So um, the unstated assumptions okay, are the things that you have to find. right? So here, um, possible assumptions could be more than one. Okay? So possible assumptions for this statement, for this issue, uh, could be first, the broken machine cannot be fixed, right? That's why the author concludes that they have to buy a new one, right? That's possible assumption. Second, uh, we cannot borrow it or, uh, or rent it from someone, right? That's why we have to buy a new one. And the third one, uh, could be we have only one machine in our office, right? That's why we have to buy a new one, right? We cannot use something else, right? Some other machines in our office, right? So these are possible assumptions, okay? So you have to figure out the assumptions and you have to attack the assumptions in order to write a, a well-argued essay, okay? Because these assumptions are going to be problematic, right? Um, what about this one? We have money to buy it. Okay, do you think that that's a good um, hidden assumption or unstated assumption? Yes or no? No, why not? Not important because that's not an issue on the, on the first statement. It's not even implied in any way. Right, so it's irrelevant to the issue, right? Um, the, the author only states that we have to buy a new copy machine. Uh, he or she doesn't make any statement as to where we would get the, 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 the capital from, right? The, so that's not an issue, that's irrelevant. So that's not a good unstated assumption for you to make, okay? So only these three, or y if you have more, um, you have to consider uh, their relevance to the issue presented, okay? So that's an example of how to find the unstated assumptions. Okay. Um, if we have time, we'll come back to this. Okay, to find the assumption. Um, okay. Before we move on, this is not a a good thesis for an issue essay. Okay. This is um, this is a bad one. Okay, um, the author makes a question about recommendation. The suggestion why appealing to in one respect may actually cause problems, such as increasing risk of uh, 
gambling, thereby causing people to fall into poverty and so on. So this is more like an argument essay rather than, or more, right, more like an issue essay rather than an uh, issue es uh, argument essay, right? So that's not something that you would want to write uh, for the argument essay, okay? Um, the third thing that you want to know is what I call logical fallacies, okay? Um, logical fallacies are simple uh, mistakes, logical mistakes that people always make, okay? And by knowing some of these, okay, you'll be able to detect the logical fallacies in the issue, okay? Um, first one is causal fallacy, what I call causal fallacy, um, in which the author confuses the cause and the effect of an issue, right? For example, when it rains, the road is wet, right? Um, and uh, since today the road is wet, it means that it must have rained, okay? Um, here, the fallacy is that because we see that it's wet, it must have rained. It could be wet for, um, uh, based on other reasons, right? Like somebody poured the water into the road and so on, right? So it might not be necessarily be the rain that causes the, the, the road to be wet, right? So this is a causal fallacy, okay? And um, this is kind of what I call the template for you to use, okay, for on the exam, okay? Um, if you see that there is a causal fallacy in the statement, you can use this template to help you, okay? I pre-construct that at home, right? And uh, I kind of, uh, not memorize, but I know what to write about when I see the causal fallacy. You can have that statement on the exam, okay? So for example, I can say that the argument relies upon the assumption that blah, blah, blah causes something, but there is no evidence to prove that cause, uh, to prove that causality and so on. So you can have that, okay, um, memorize or you can be, uh, get yourself familiar with that before the exam, okay? So that's one type of logical fallacy. Um, the second one is false analogy. Uh, two things are similar in one aspect but may not share other aspects, right? And you will see this a lot on the GRE test, okay? They might try to compare two cities, okay, or two states, okay, and they will, they will uh, conclude that since city A did something, we should follow suit, okay, and that assumes that two cities are similar, okay, in every way, which is not the case, okay, so you'll find that a lot, and this is a kind of a pre-made template for you to use. Okay, so you can, at home, you can get yourself familiar with that, okay, and uh, prepare yourself for the exam, okay? And there are other um, fallacies, uh, limited choice fallacy, take it or leave it, which means you have only two choices available, okay, um, which in reality is not the case, right? You may have more choices to choose from, right? Uh, just like in the example that we just used, uh, we have to buy the machine. Okay, buy or not buy it. We could rent it, right? We could borrow it from someone else. That could be an option too, right? So that's one um, fallacy that you might wanna uh, consider. And this one, the next one, the number fallacy is another one that uh, you'll find a lot on the GRE test, okay? So um, basically, a person uses a number, okay, to justify the conclusion that he or she makes, okay? Um, for example, the body, combat, uh, the body Combat Club claims that the university should support more funding because its membership has increased by 100% recently, okay? And the number that they use is the 100% member, the, the increase in the membership, right? Which uh, might not be the reason as to why funding, sh more funding should be given to the club, right? Uh, other, reasons, uh, other reasons or other factors should be given also in order to get more funding, right? Um, survey statistic fallacy is another one that's interesting, okay? Um, typically, the GRE test will present you with some statement about a poll that uh, some people collect, okay? Um, and um, they'll use that as a reason to support the conclusion, okay? but you will have to attack that fallacy, 
okay, saying that um, you don't know. Okay, saying that you don't know who conducted the poll, for example, and you don't know whether uh, the group or the population would be representative okay, to make that conclusion. Okay, because they won't give you any details about that on the GRE, so you have to attack these points. Okay? Um, always the same pol uh, policy. Okay, um, what happened in the past would be taken as the same for the future. Okay, and you, ha you can attack that uh, policy as well. Okay, um, against the man policy, this one would attack a personal characteristic of a person and says that that person is not suited for the job. Okay, but that personal characteristic might not be, might not have anything to do with the job. Okay, so for example, Bill Clinton is a bad president because he's unfaithful to his wife. Okay, so the, the, the thing is, the thing that you have to attack is being faithful or not faithful to his wife might not be related, might not be relevant to his quality as a president. Okay, uh, straw man fallacy. Uh, this last one is to take an issue to an extreme. Okay, uh, just like a straw man, right? Um, um, those who favor gun control legislation just want to take all guns away from responsible citizens and put them in the hands of the criminal. Okay, that is to one extreme. Okay, uh, people who um, favor gun control legislation might not have that end, might not have that extreme end as the goal. Right, so you can attack that as well. Okay, so these are uh, nine. Um, common policies that you will see on the GRE test. Okay, just get yourself familiar with these policies so that when you are presented with an issue, you can recognize the policy readily. Okay, and also you can use the pre-made template that I have here um, as something that you would uh, have on the essay as well. Okay, question? Um, Do you want to press that? What is the difference between the straw man policy and the limited choice policy? Uh, for for the limited choice policy, a uh, policy you have only two choices available to choose from. Um, either you are against us or you are with us, right? But you, sh but in reality, you have more than these two choices, right? But the straw man policy is that to to present a slippery slope in the sense that um, uh, the author is trying to push the the issue to an extreme, which might make which might make it uh, more dangerous than it usually is. Okay. All right. So we have already talked about three things, right? The argument structure, that's the first thing, and then how to find the unstated assumptions, right? Unstated assumptions have to be relevant to the issue, right? And the last thing is logical fallacies. Okay. So. Next step is how to put these on the actual essay, right? Again, I have these five or six steps, okay? And they are pretty much similar to the steps that we um, already um, did for the issue essay, okay? The first thing is you have to understand the topic. You spend uh, one or two minutes there. And then they set the argument in search of the assumptions. You can use about five minutes there, okay? And then get a points by a mind map again, two minutes. Um, add the details as you type, okay? Uh, one minute and start typing and doing the uh, revising and the uh, editing work would be five minutes, okay? So let me show you um, the structure of the essay here, okay? So again, you will have three major parts, the intro, the body, and the conclusion, okay? Same as the issue essay, okay? Exactly the same thing, okay? And what you have inside each paragraph is pretty much the same as well, okay? So for example, in the intro, you should summarize the conclusion and the supporting idea, just restate the issue so as to show that you understand, okay, what's being presented, what is being proposed, okay? And then present your thesis statement, okay? That's, it's logically flawed, right? That should be the same for all um, argument essay, right? Because as I said, all the statements that are given to you will be logically flawed in some ways, right? So you will have to say that it's logically flawed, okay? And then why it's flawed briefly, okay? Um, 
and then three or four body paragraphs, each one attacking an assumption or a fallacy. Okay? And finally, you can have the conclusion paragraph in which you summarize and then give a solution to make the argument stronger or better. Okay? So let me show you one example, one real example. Um, this is a topic um, given by the GRE. Okay? And um, there's a city called Monroe, okay, that's the city, and um, a jazz music club okay, uh, proposed that, uh, proposes that uh, the, um, actually this, this statement is written as part of the application for a small business um, loan by a group of developers in the town Monroe. Okay? And they proposed that uh, the bank should give them um, a loan to establish a club, a jazz club. Okay? The reasons being, first, the nearest jazz club is 65 miles away from Monroe. Okay? So it's far away. Okay? So we would be good. Okay? We would be in a good position to establish a jazz club there in Monroe. Okay? And uh, another reason, you can see the signal word here, plus. Last year, um, over um, 100,000 people attended the jazz festival in Monroe. Okay? So uh, the author thinks that, well, that's a good evidence, a good piece of evidence to show that um, a loan should be given. Okay? And um, in Monroe, uh, there are a lot of uh, jazz radio programs, right? And uh, people like it. Okay? And uh, there's a statistic here given to you, a nationwide study, right, show that, shows that a jazz fan spends um, about $1,000 per year on jazz products. So that's why um, to establish a jazz um, club in Monroe would be a good idea, okay? So that's the other reasons. Do you think that all the reasons here are logically flawed in some ways. Again, when you're given a statement like this, you have to suspect that it's logically flawed, right? On the GRE, of course, for the purposes of the, the GRE. Do you think that there are some problems with the reasons? What could be some problems? Remember the fallacies that we just talked about? Um, the people that attended the jazz festival might have not been from Monroe. Right. So the uh, sample, uh, the sampling group, right, might not be representative of um, the people in Monroe, right? So there could be people from somewhere else, right? And uh, that wouldn't support the argument that uh, people in Monroe will buy the services from the of the club, right? Anything else? So that's a good one. Anything else? So there are, th uh, um, there are like about three reasons, right, that uh, the author gives to support his position, right? Um, the jazz club is 60 miles away. Uh, the uh, 100,000 people attending the uh, jazz festival last year, and also uh, radio programs, and uh, the nationwide study, like uh, that, that, that shows that people spend about uh, $1,000 per year, okay? So you have to attack these three or four reasons. So that's one already. Anything else? And there's no guarantee that they'd spend $1,000 a year at a jazz club in Monroe. Right, right. So uh, people who spend $1,000 on jazz uh, products elsewhere might not do the same, right? Might not have the same um, buying behavior in Monroe too, right? So that would be another one to attack. Anything else? You can assume that the well-known jazz musicians would be interested in this club. I'm sorry? Because it says several well-known jazz musicians live in Monroe. Okay. So the problem is? Right, right. That could be another one. Anything else? Or that they're then they have a contact with someone else. else. I'm sorry? Um, then they have a contact with someone else elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, I'm going really. Right, right, right. Well, you go to the 
What about the uh, high-rated radios programs? One real example. Um, this is a topic um, given by the GRE. Okay, and um, there's a city called Monroe. Okay, that's the city, and um, a jazz music club. Okay. Uh, propose that uh, proposes that uh, the um, actually this this statement is written as part of the application for a small business um, loan by a group of developers in the town Monroe. Okay, and they propose that uh, the bank should give them um, a loan to establish a club, a jazz club. Okay, the reasons being first. The nearest jazz club is 65 miles away from Monroe. Okay, so it's farther away. Okay, so we would be good. Okay, we would be in a good position to establish a jazz club there in Monroe. Okay, and uh, another reason you can see the signal word here plus. Last year, um, over a um, hundred thousand people attended the jazz festival in Monroe. Okay, so. Uh, the author thinks that, well, that's a good evidence, a good piece of evidence to show that um, a loan should be given. Okay? And um, in Monroe, uh, there are a lot of uh, jazz radio programs, right? And uh, people like it. Okay? And uh, there's a statistic here given to you, a nationwide study, right, show that, shows that a jazz fan spends um, about $1,000 per year. On jazz products, so that's why um, to establish a jazz um, club in Monroe would be a good idea. Okay, so that's the all the reasons. Do you think that all the reasons here are logically flawed in some ways? Again, when you are given a statement like this, you have to suspect that it's logically flawed, right? on the GRE, of course, for the purposes of the, the GRE. Do you think that there are some problems with the reasons? What could be some problems? Remember the fallacies that we just talked about? Um, the people that attended the jazz festival might have not been from Monroe. Right. So the, uh, sample, uh, the sampling group right, might not be representative of um, the people in Monroe, right? So there could be people from somewhere else, right? And uh, that wouldn't support the argument that uh, people in Monroe will buy the services from the, of the club, right? Anything else? So that's a good one. Anything else? So there are, th uh, um, there are like about three reasons, right, that uh, the author gives to support his position, right? Um, the jazz club is 60 miles away. Uh, the, uh, 100,000 people attending the uh, jazz festival last year, and also uh, radio programs, and uh, the nationwide study, like uh, that 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 shows that people spend about a thousand dollars per year. Okay, so you have to attack these three or four reasons. So that's one already. Anything else? And there's no guarantee that they'd spend a thousand dollars a year at a jazz club. Right, right. So uh, people who spend a thousand dollar on jazz uh, products elsewhere might not do the same, right? Might not have the same um, buying behavior in Monroe too, right? So that would be another one to attack. Anything else? Do you can assume that the well-known jazz musicians would be interested in this club. I'm sorry. Because it says several well-known jazz musicians. Live in Monroe. Okay. So the problem is that those jazz musicians would maybe not use their club. Right, right. That could be another one. Anything else? Or that they're then they have a contract with someone else. I'm sorry? Um, then they have a contract with someone else elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, I'm going really. Right, right, right.
What about the uh, high-rated radios programs? The fact that radio programs are um, popular in Monroe wouldn't be a, a convincing piece of evidence to support that the club would be successful too, right? So that would be another thing that you can attack. Okay. So um, these are some things that you can attack, and you can just choose three or four okay, on the exam. Okay? So for example, um, the number fallacy, right? Uh, 100,000 people, who are these people? Are they representative of the people in Monroe? Right? Are they jazz fans? Uh, are they seasonal fans or regular fans? And so on. Okay? Uh, quality of the data fallacy, uh, the highest rate, uh, rated radio evidence um, does not necessarily predict that the club would be successful, right? Uh, the number poli uh, policy, the na uh, national 1,000 uh, a, a year expense on jazz doesn't necessarily apply to Monroe, right? OK. Yeah. Um, well, I. Did you press the button? Yes. It, it's, it seems that some of them, I mean, I guess I'm trying to find what would be considered you know, good enough of a reason because nothing is 100 percent but for me like number five seems reasonable because the 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 only club close to this people is 65 miles away so if you think about it people would attend people that live in monroe it's like the only club that's that they can actually go to and they don't have to drive 65 miles or am i misunderstanding this right 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 that's correct but um when a bank uh, decide whether to grant a loan, right? Um, they do that decision based on whether or not that business will be successful, right? right? But um, the fact that people will attend that business would be would 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 not be a good convincing piece of evidence for that business to be successful, right? That could be like the initial, during the initial period of the business, right? People might attend that jazz club during the initial period, but then later on, it might not prosper. That could be one thing. And you could say that in the, um, in the actual paper, in the actual essay as well, right? So you can uh, ex explain this, elaborate on this, and filling in the details there, okay? <laughs> That statement doesn't actually, it doesn't give you numbers as to how many people from Monroe are actually attending, right. going to that particular club. And then so. that would uh, follow from other fallacies that you have already described or explained above as well, right? Um, that you don't know how many jazz fans there are in Monroe, okay? So that's why this might be a good thing to attack as well, okay? And you can explain that details, whatever you think. Um, the more elaborate you, um, the more elaborated reason you have on this, the better. Okay. Right. So that's another reason. Right. And you can put that. You should put that in the essay as well. Okay, the explanation of that, okay? So um, as for the finished essay, okay, you can see that on the other side of the handout, okay, this is a single piece handout, and I could show it on the screen as well, which is here, okay? So there are two pages, okay? Again, the structure is going to be the same, okay, as the issue essay, okay? Here you will start with the intro paragraph, right? And you will start with a restatement of the argument of the author, okay? Restatement of the argument to show that you understand the issue and you can restate it in your own words. So that's good, okay? Because it will establish you as a critical reader, okay? You know what's going on. You know what's being proposed. And then your claim, your thesis. And your thesis should be the same, right? In that you will say that it's logically flawed, okay? While the argument seems convincing, 
on first glance. There are significant and underlying flaws that raise doubt about the author's conclusion. You can use that as your thesis for all the argument essays. Okay? So you can memorize that, okay? or you can use a different version that says about the same thing. Okay? And then paragraph two will be, again, the first weakness, the first logical weakness. Okay? And then you will explain, you will elaborate on that weakness, right? Using examples, using explanations as to why you don't think that that's a strong logical piece of evidence. Okay? And you do that with, let's see, you do that with all the paragraphs here. And uh, you should have about three or four. You should have about three or four logical weaknesses. Okay, and those are the unstated assumptions that you need to attack. And you will start with why is weak. Okay, and then the reason. Okay. Finally, you will come to a conclusion. Here is the concluding paragraph. In the conclusion you need to summarize, this is the same for the issue essay as well, you need to summarize all the weaknesses. You need to summarize all the weaknesses. And then, ideally, okay, this is important, you need to give some suggestions as to how the argument could be stronger, okay? For example, in this one, therefore, if the author were to provide greater evidence regarding the jazz festival, the radio listeners, and the relevance of the national survey, and the similarity between uh, this club and the competitor, his argument would be more convincing, okay? so. These are the suggestions that you make, okay? And the suggestions stem from all the logical weaknesses that you have already identified, okay? You can say that if uh, more evidence could be given on this and this, right? And if um, the, uh, for example, if the survey uh, discloses who um, conduct the surveys and who were the participants, you could do that, okay? So, again, don't forget to have the suggestions at the end. Okay? So this will show that you have the critical skills okay, on the GRE exam. Any questions about the argument essay? So to summarize here, for, the both, uh, for both parts of the analytical writing section, okay, you have to write two types of essays, right? The first thing is the issue essay, and the second thing is the argument essay. And the tests are different, okay? But what's the same is the structure of the essay, right? You have to have the intro where you restate the issue, right? And then you have to have the thesis, okay? And then three or four reasons, okay? With examples and with explanations. And then you have a conclusion, which Restates all, which restates all the points that you have already made and then provide some suggestions as to how you would make it better. Okay? So, um, since uh, we are tight on time here, let's proceed to the reading section. Okay? The reading section here is part of the verbal section. Okay? And um, for the reading section, you will have about 10 passages or so, okay? Um, but the good thing is that you will have only one paragraph passage, or at most, you will have two paragraphs passage, okay? So that's good. It's not as long as it used to be, okay? Uh, in the old format, you might have like five paragraphs um, passages. Okay? So, but here it's good that you have only one or two at most, 
okay? And you'll have 10 passages, okay? And you'll be asked about two to four questions based on each passage, okay? And the questions will test your ability to assess the author's purpose and meaning. That is the main idea. So you have to be able to catch the main idea of the passage, okay? And it will test you the ability to make inferences that can be drawn from the passages, okay? And finally, the ability to locate the specific information. This is something that has just been added uh, to the new format, okay? So I will talk about the question, uh, these questions um, in, in order, okay? Um, you will have about three types of uh, questions on the reading comprehension part, okay? The first type is that you will have to select the best answer uh, choice from five choices given, okay? And it's usually going to be about the main idea or what's implied by the passage or what's incorrect or correct about the passage, okay? And uh, this includes a, a function question, okay? I will talk about a, a function question later on. Um, so a, an, an example is um, the bolded sentence in the passage functions too. That's the function question, okay? And then you'll be given a, a bolded statement, okay, from the passage, okay? And you have to answer, uh, choose the answer that best represents the function of that bolded passage. Uh, is it the, um, the thesis statement, or is it the conclusion, or is it uh, doing the uh, supporting evidence for the uh, passage? Okay, so you have to choose the best, uh, the best answer choice from all of the five. So that's one type of question. The second type of question is you have to select all that apply, meaning um, you will be given three answer choices, and you have to choose answers that are correct, okay, which could be more than one, okay? And no partial credit will be given to uh, partial, uh, partial um, answer that you choose. So for example, uh, which of the following is or are correct according to the passage? Um, X is Y, Y follows Z, Z causes A. So if this and this are correct, you have to choose both, okay? Uh, if you choose only one, you will get no credit for it. And if you choose the, the wrong answer, then of course you're not given any credit for it, right? So you have to choose all that apply, okay? So if all of them are correct, you have to choose all of them, all three, okay? If you think that the first and the second are correct, you have to choose that both, okay? So you, in this kind of question, you have to consider each choice separately, okay? Meaning, uh, this first choice has nothing to do with the second choice, and the second choice has nothing to do with the third choice. You have to ch consider each choice separately, okay? And the third type of question is uh, for you to locate a specific sentence in the passage, okay? So you have to use the mouse to click on the statement, on the proper statement that um, that corresponds to the, to the question, okay? For example, you'll be asked to select the sentence in the passage where the author states that A is B. So you have to use your mouse to click on the sentence that means A is B, for example, okay? Uh, for some tips, um, as for some tips that I could give you, uh, for this one, you have to speed read and take very short notes using a mind map or, um, and uh, do it on scratch paper, okay? And the first two sentences are absolutely important, okay? Because they contain a thesis or the claim of that passage, okay? And so are the last two sentences as they are um, conclusion, okay? So if you run out of time, just look at the first two uh, sentences so that you know what's it about, and also the last two sentences, okay? And use your notes to find the right paragraph where the right information is, and never memorize anything, okay? Because you are not tested on memorization here, and you can always go back to the passage so that's why there's no need to memorize things, okay? Uh, use your scratch paper, okay? And try making a prediction on the right answer before you see the, uh, before you look at the answer choices, okay? And that will help guide you whether you look for the, the right answer, 
okay? And try eliminating wrong choices and beware of trick choices. And we'll talk about trick choices and wrong choices um, in a minute here, okay? And um, when you look at the question stems, you have to look at the keywords, okay? For example, the word state means that the information is clearly given. The word suggest means that it's not explicitly stated. Okay, so you have to look at this question stem. Okay? And passages will have keywords like however, nevertheless, in addition, and so on. So those are the keywords that you need to take a note of. And then, uh, for example, however means that it's, con 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 it's gonna be contradictory, right? So um, note those uh, keywords, okay? Um, finally, uh, for the function questions, um, you'll be given the bolder statement in the passage, right? You have to consider these statements in relation to the whole passage because it will ask you what the function of that bold statement is. So you have to consider that in relation to other sentences in the passage in order to know the function of that, okay? And don't just focus on the bolded part, okay? Uh, wrong choices to be eliminated, answers that contradict your notes or understanding that would go first, um, answers phrased with absolute wording, that's something that's suspicious and you should uh, get rid of it. For example, absolute meaning um, implies words like always, no one, ever, never. Okay, so all those are things that you can find um, exceptions to easily. Um, answers that are taken from a wrong paragraph, and you can get this from, of course, uh, your note, right? And answers that look like it's quoted from the passage or cited directly, okay? So uh, people will um, choose this as their answer, okay? Because they think that, well, that looks the same as what's in the passage, right? But that's obvious. That's usually a trick choice, okay? And uh, the right answers are usually paraphrase statements, okay? Rather than just direct quotes from the passage, okay? So you should uh, suspect that when uh, you see a kind of a very similar looking um, choice, okay? So let's uh, practice questions. I have just two passages here, okay? And uh, this is the first passage, okay? I asked you to circle the best choice that gives you the main idea of this passage, okay? Which of these choices best represents the main idea of the passage here. You have that on your handout as well, okay? Just one. So from A to E, this is um, choosing the best answer from the five answers choices given, right? You have that on your um, handout as well. It's going to be on page, uh, and, um, let's see. It's going to be on last page, on the last page, on page 8. I'll give you two minutes. Okay, most of you are finished. So, uh, which of these choices would have to go first, do you think? Which uh, choices you could eliminate first? A, you could eliminate that, right, because there is no cause and effect relationship between the, uh, the first one and the second one, right? Uh, the paragraph here 
didn't state that Rome defeated its opponent because it could move quickly, right? Those are two separate things that make uh, Rome an, a, a, a powerful empire, right? So that could go first. And what another one that could go first is number, uh, number D. Uh, there is the absolute language here that you can see. Um, let's see, let me circle that. Was always better, right? The paragraph didn't say anything about being always better, right? So that will have to go. Um, so we have B, C, and E left. Okay? So what's the answer? We have someone say B, some people say C. Um, we don't choose E, right? I, I didn't hear anyone say uh, E. So we don't choose E, right? Because there's nothing about, um, let's see, uh, there's nothing uh, cause and effect about uh, building the transport system and uh, was able to build a big empire, right? So, um, so we have B and C. Which one is better? I would say number C is better, okay? Um, number B is good, nothing's wrong with it, but one point that I could make is that um, the cause and effect is not captured in numbers in B, okay? Um, but that cause and effect is captured completely in C, okay? So basically here, what the uh, paragraph states is that uh, Rome could build, um, could maintain a large empire because it has a good transportation system, right? And its army is ef uh, was efficient as well. So two things. And they could move quickly from place to place. So uh, number C is correct. Okay? Um, let's see. So let's move on to the next one, okay? Um, here I have two questions based on this passage. Okay, I'll give you about two minutes, okay, to do two questions. You see the bold statement, right? And uh, the question asks you about the function of that bold statement. Okay, that's the first question. So what's the function of that bolded statement? Develop an argument, conclusion of an argument, evidence supporting a conclusion, evidence supporting an objection or thesis. So which one would you choose? So which one could you eliminate first? C and D. You can eliminate C. Okay, you can eliminate D. It's not the conclusion. It's not the conclusion. So what else do you have? Develop an argument and then the thesis. So it is the thesis, but it helps you develop an argument. So I would choose, in this case, Number E, a thesis. Um, the thing is, a thesis will have to be an explicit statement, okay? And anything could develop an argument, okay? Um, this one could be an argument as well. Different, state, uh, different standards of media coverage account for this uh, erroneous belief. That could be uh, the function. To, the, the function could be to develop an argument as well. So, but this one 
the, it's best to choose that it's the thesis sentence, okay? Because without that, you can try cutting it out. And then without that, the paragraph here wouldn't have a unified kind of a statement that um, would cover all the arguments being made here, okay? So you would choose it as a thesis, okay? So, and um, following from that, what's the best What's the best statement that represents the author's main idea in this paragraph? Oops. Sorry, I need to turn this off. A, B, C, D, or E. Just choose one that's the best. You, sometimes you might see two equally good ones, but there will always be the best one. Okay? D or E is about choosing the best answer. Okay, which one did you choose? Number B is the best answer, okay? Number A is not correct because this is beyond what the passage says. You cannot choose anything that's, that goes beyond the passage, okay? And you cannot use your personal knowledge, personal experience, or anything like that when you read. You have to go by the passage, what the passage says. Here, it doesn't say anything, the passage, didn't say anything about it being relatively minor. So you can uh, cut that out, uh, take that out. Um, number C, this is the, um, the, the weakness there. Uh, driving is more dangerous than flying because different standards of media have forced airlines to, uh, to improve the safety standard. That has nothing to do with the passage, so that's out. Uh, number D, many people believe that flying is more dangerous than diving, even though overwhelming if evidence points to the opposite conclusion. This is the opposite of what's being presented there. And number E, media coverage is responsible for the belief that flying is more dangerous than driving, even though every year more people are killed. Um, there's nothing that says about every year, uh, every year more people are killed okay, um, in, the, in the car accidents. Okay? So, the best answer would be number B. Okay, so that one is correct. D is, D is reinstated, pretty much what. Yeah, and then it, it kind of looks uh, like what's being taken from. It yeah, looks like that is being taken from that, right? right? So that's a suspicious choice that you want to kind of um, raise, yeah, raise your uh, doubt against. And then um, if you consider that choice D, it is totally the opposite of what's said in the passage. Okay? Um, let's see. Many people believe that flying is more dangerous than driving, even though overwhelming evidence point to the opposite conclusion. Is there any conclusion drawn in that? In that well, passage? Evidence, evidence um, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, so that to me is telling me. See, I, I feel that D is pretty much the same sen first sentence just expressed in different order. Um, many people believe that flying is more dangerous than driving, that's stated, even though overwhelming, it's just a different order. But right, right. Um, is there any evidence that's being shown in the passage here? Just despite overwhelming evidence. 
To the contrary. To the contrary. Many people think that flying is more dangerous than driving. Is there, what, what's the conclusion that's being drawn in here? Does the author conclude that flying is dangerous or more dangerous or less dangerous than driving? No. Did, she, did he or she draw that conclusion? No. I think the author, whoever is writing that, is saying that most people think that flying is more dangerous than driving, but there is, more, there is evidence that implies the opposite. Right. And that he's not concluding which one is more dangerous. He's just saying that it's the media. The media is the cause of why people are doing the other. Right. So there's no conclusion that's being drawn by the author, right? That, that's my point, that um, there's no conclusion that's being drawn whether uh, uh, flying or driving is more dangerous, OK? Because what the media does is only right, direct people's attention to to, to, to the news, right? Yeah. But here, um, there, there, some conclusion is being drawn here, right? So, any other questions? No? So, um, today we have looked at uh, both sections, the analytical writing section and also the reading comprehension section. Um, I hope that some tips that I have given you today would be useful for you to use on your essay and your, um, your reading comprehension part, okay? And I wish you all the best in your GRE test, okay? And uh, if you have any questions, just uh, let me know, okay? And um, let's see. Any questions? No? Nope. So um, I'll see you on campus here sometimes, okay? And uh, best of luck for your um, GRE tests. Thank you.